mm-hmm. out in the Pac-12. A lot of people believe that is obviously the biggest um, and best when it comes to the quarterbacks in college football. You have a lot of big names. You've got a lot of returning guys. You have one kid in DJ Ugalale moving from South Carolina and Clemson going all the way out west to Oregon State. So we'll talk a lot of quarterbacks. There were some Pac, uh, Pac-12 Media Day stuff uh, that we will go over. I, I guess, Joe, we can we can start there. Just some very quick highlights before we start talking about quarterbacks. What what stood out to you? I, I mean, look, I'm not trying to be weird here because we're live and fresh on Bleacher Report. But, dude, the Pac-12 did their media days in a, in a very interesting place, Joe. But well, look, my biggest thing, and I was very focused on the commentary from USC for obvious reasons. Lincoln Riley is polarizing. Caleb Williams right. is even more polarizing. Wasn't exactly a fan of how he answered some of the questions and the demeanor that he had. That is a separate issue. But the thing that's just a joke is George Klyovkov and the way that he addressed the media. That being the Pac-12 commissioner, by the way, for people who don't know. Yes, the way that he addressed the media rights deals. And for anyone who's tuned into our show, and I actually implore, again, people to go check out our channel, one of our most watched videos is us talking about how the Big 12 has passed the Pac-12 and all these jokes about they're going to be on gas station TV. They don't even have a suitor. And I quote tweeted this today that Klyovkov had said, the longer we wait, the better the deal. That's not how that works. That's really not how that works. And it sounds like you don't even really have a negotiating partner at this time that is excited about taking you on as an entity the longer you wait the sooner that people are going to leave your damn conference so i that's the big thing that that is needs to be talked about more after today well he did say though to not to counteract what you're saying but he contradicts himself right like i think yes. this is the biggest thing for me because later he would come on and he would specifically talk about joe that we're not going to announce our tv deal that we have si- signed now what he said was, we're, we wanted to talk about football today. Well, yeah. just let it be known to – this is where these things are announced, right? Like, this was yes. the ultimate opportunity <laughs> that if you actually did uh. have a signing of a TV deal that you would have announced it here. We saw it from the Big 12. We saw it from the SEC this week alone about Oklahoma, Texas, and the TV contracts that were going on, Joe. So – when, when I look at – no, you don't – do you really – is this going to be on the CW? Is this going to be on – you know, did Amazon Prime buy this? Like, who – I don't believe, Joe, that they're not going to be without a TV contract. Yeah. Who is it? You know, so t- let, tell us who that's going to be. I, I, I think for me – I do think for me it's an interesting day in Pac-12 and college football history – because not only in the Big 12, and we talked about that, Joe, on our channel, on our show, but not only is the Big 12, like, I mean, the Big 10 getting two new additions from the PAC. Now the PAC is answering the questions of, in Texas, Oklahoma, going to the SEC, everybody's being asked about the realignment. They were asked today in the Pac-12, and it's, it's non-viral. Joe, they're doing this on a Friday. When you have Lincoln Riley that is – talking about things it should you should be doing this during the week it, friday is a media dead period nobody's on there so no. just the entire thing of today for me for the pac-12 media days it completely just went to a place where i did not think it it should have been yeah i that's the the big part for me and not to 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 labor the belabor the point here on on the media right stuff before we get into these quarterback rankings. I I'm just, that's where I'm at. It is such a non impactful conference at this point when it comes to the media day conversations. And I think that they really swung and missed with an opportunity here. It's almost as if you're doing it in the shadow of the sec that you're doing it at the end of the week. But uh, we should definitely dive into talking about these rankings because I think that there is, is going to be a, uh, you know, a nice, nice debate here on some of these placements of some of these guys. Five three niners wants us to go ahead and move on. He doesn't even know who we are. He said, "Just <laughs> put the list. Nobody wants to sit here and listen to you jabber." Well, then I don't know what to make tell your you own about. list. Make your own list. <laughs> Joe, we haven't been in here for six minutes. We've been in here for six minutes, and he's. I mean, 
53 Niners, I mean, maybe you should worry about what you're doing at quarterback because Brock Purdy was the only thing that saved you last year. Don't be a Rudy Poo in the chat. Look, I, he's not wrong, though. Let, let's yeah, let's get to the list. list. <laughs> Listen, we talked about, Joe, Yeah. the – um. we talked about this so much, too, but just the simple nature that the Pac-12 has arguably – the most marketable quarterbacks in all of college football, you're not there. The conference is not pushing them out enough. So we'll go through this three tier list. Like who is the best and up top, who is the middle tilt quarterbacks that we think is coming or in the conference. And then these newcomers, you got two really electrics. Everybody knows the Jaden Rashada story. Everybody knows what happened with Dante Moore. Man, why are they not pushing that is is the biggest mm -hmm. question to me. But look, the day should have been stolen. I think the day is stolen by Bo Nix. It's stole by Caleb Williams. It's stole by Cam Rising. And I, I guess you could talk about Michael Penix in there too, and you know how much I, I love Michael Penix. So I think that those are the four quarterbacks that if you're going to do something in the Pac-12 this year, one of those four are going to have to lead you to that. So – those are my four biggest headlines, my four biggest quarterbacks moving into this. Yeah, at the top for me, and I actually I, I want to include another guy into this conversation. So, look, we already know who Caleb Williams is, and I think we're going to have a separate uh, debate on where he fits into this conversation. The guy won the Heisman Trophy. He's one of the most electric playmakers in all of college football. No one's going to sit here and debate that. Is he enough to help USC's deficiencies get past more well-rounded teams? Again, we're going to get to that in a little bit. But – Bo Nix, Michael Penix, we know what they are. They're veteran guys that came from other schools that have all the tools, different tools that work for their various systems that have set them up for a lot of success. But I'm going to go as far as to say this, Blake. I actually, I think that Cam Rising has been very overvalued up until this point. I think that Cam Rising is one of the more average quarterbacks in college football and for whatever reason has been propped up to be somebody who belongs in this upper echelon conversation I believe that Cam Rising, in his second season at the FBS level, having watched him plenty dominate Incarnate Ward and has a stupid arm, people try to make comparisons from Caleb Williams to Patrick Mahomes. If somebody has that type of an arm, it's Cam Ward. Cam Ward at Washington State is ready, ready to pop off and explode, and I believe he passes Cam Rising, and don't be shocked if he doesn't pass his way into that top three conversation because he is ridiculously talented. The problem that I have when you say stuff like that, okay, and what makes you the ultimate college football Rudy Poo, mm -hmm. is there's a difference, Joe, in when you talk about good or really great college, uh, college quarterbacks, Cam Rising as the back-to-back -back reigning defending Pac-12 champion, it's the Stetson Bennett argument. You oh, no. Cannot, you cannot. How are you going to tell me that you can't put him in that upper echelon when he went toe-to-toe -to -toe twice, twice with Caleb Williams and outperformed him? How are you going to – look, Joe, well, let's call it what it is. Okay. You're, you're loved. I mean, oh, Anthony Richardson's the best quarterback of all time. That's things that you say. That's not what, I, that's not what I said. That's not what I said. But you loved Anthony Richardson. He was, he was dueling with Anthony Richardson a year ago. It doesn't matter about being the prospect, Joe. It matters about being the champion. And right now, right now, he is the champion of the conference. You got to, you know, you ever heard the songs R E S P E C T? You, you ever heard Birdman some, say, put some respect on my name? Put some respect on that man's name. I'm putting some respect on his name, but all I'm trying to get at here is that I am going to place Cam Ward ahead of him. And it, you're right. This is exactly like the Stetson Bennett argument that uh, that was the inception of the show. We There was a, a whole controversial opinion that I stated that I don't think Stetson Bennett deserves as all the credit for them winning those two national championships. Cam Rising is in the same situation here where he is supported by elite defensive play calling. He is supported by an elite defense, a team with a really good, aggressive run game. They also have a very underrated offensive line. I give a lot more credit to Andy Ludwig and what they do in the run game, setting up Cam Rising to be successful then I say that Cam Rising Cam is the Rising reason why they've gotten far. Of 34, let's, though, Joe. Let's he see how he does without Dalton Kincaid. Let's see how he does without Dalton Kincaid. I, that was a big, big 
massive dump off target for him. I don't know how he's going to do see without how Caleb Williams that. does without his number one, his first round wide receiver. You can't do that to somebody. Oh, well, let's see what he looks Wait, like. But Caleb this. Williams is more talented physically than Cam Rising is. It Caleb doesn't Williams matter has better how receivers on his gonna, roster than Cam okay, Rising. Okay, well, this is going to transition us into the Caleb Williams argument. Okay. How can you say that well, when Caleb Williams lost Jordan Addison? Because he's adding Dorian Singer, and he already has Mario Williams. I don't on care team. if he was in, if he was adding Jesus H Christ Almighty. It, when you lose a first round pick, it affects you. It, he it added the Belinikoff the Belinikoff Award winner. But here's the difference, though, between those two things: is that your best receiver was Dalton Kincaid, your tight end, and then after that, there's a significant drop off to the next best option that you have. He does. He does have a very good running back, and he does have a very good run game. He's got actually a good stable of running backs on that roster that helps Cam Rising. But his offensive weapons to throw the football to, it, it's a who's who conversation. I know that Jordan Addison's gone, and they already have a bunch of first-round caliber are you receivers. Are you confident recruits. that USC takes down Utah? I, are you Yes or no? Are you confident that they take down Utah? Yes, but I don't think that they win the conference, but I think that they beat Utah this year. I don't think Utah is as good as they've been mapped out to be. I think that Utah uh, benefited from an injured Caleb Williams last year, but this upcoming season, I Which time? Don't the think first one when he kicked his ass or the second time he kicked his the, ass? The second time. I Look, I'm kind of having two separate conversations in, in what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that, that USC – beats Washington and Oregon and I, we've said this on the show we don't we both don't think that USC wins the conference there's more well-rounded teams but I don't see Utah as this scary opponent I just don't they're a tough team to beat they're a hard-nosed team and they benefited from a lot last year that helped them win the Pac-12 championship that's the reality of it I, I just I, I don't understand the premise from people when somebody wins the conference and dominates in the conference like Cam Rising does, that you can say that USC is ready. Now, we can make the deep, the deeper argument about team, Joe, but I think that Caleb Williams just kind of has to show me something a little bit. Like, And I know that this is what we'll talk about the most, but mm -hmm. at, at some point, yeah, he's talented. He's probably going to be the number one overall pick. He's the reigning defending Heisman Trophy winner. Can he win it again? I, I, don't, I don't know that. The problem, though, is is that he has three other quarterbacks in this conference that have the ability to win the conference. People don't talk about Cam Rising repeating. They don't talk about Bo Nix. We don't talk about Michael Penix Jr., who, by the right. way, Washington has so many things. So those top-tier guys and, – and listen, Joe, I know you're going to hate this. Oregon State is a, is a touchdown away from being USC a year ago. They are a touchdown yes. away, okay? Yes. DJ used better than what they had. So, yes. Is DJ not, we can poo poo on him all we want to. We can poo poo on him. The problem is, is that is he not worth a touchdown in the game? Can he not give you that, that extra step? Because here's the truth. Yeah. DJ's had more of these high profile games than CJ has. I mean, CJ, Caleb Williams has. So, DJ's actually won a couple. Like, I remember Notre Dame. I remember the Florida State game. Can Caleb Williams win the big one? Oh, well, Blake, Mr. Blake, he beat USC. Sounds good. He's one and three against top 25 opponents. I didn't He's, even say UCLA there, by the way, but I understand your point. But you, I, I, right. I, I, mean, actually, I really agree with your point. And this is where, like, I get really conflicted and why I, it's – if we're doing a prospect ranking, Caleb Williams is number one. Plain and simple, Caleb Williams is number but this one. This isn't and a prospect ranking, though, yes. right? It's it's not. I and here again, this is where I'm I'm very conflicted. I don't think Caleb Williams is enough for USC to beat more well-rounded teams. I don't think, and they talked about this some of this stuff today when when he was asked on a media day. They're asking him like, "Do you think that this?" Your, your roster is is more well-rounded and, and all these things. Like, how do you think you've developed in the trenches were some of the questions that have that have asked him. They do not have a better offensive line than Oregon and Washington. They do not have a better overall defense or uh, 
defensive backfield than what Oregon and Washington are bringing to the field. I am not afraid of that general USC roster because of their defensive deficiencies. And for that reason, I am reluctant to pick USC to beat Bo Nix and to beat Michael Penix. But I am not going to sit here and not place him at the top of my quarterback list. I'm not going to do it. I'm not, no, I'm never, not a hack. I'm, I'm not going to do it. I, I never. But when did I ever say that? I don't think that that's the argument. I, I don't think that you can have the argument and say that he's not on the top tier after winning the Heisman Trophy. My problem is, is that in the biggest days, in the biggest games, in the biggest spotlight, more people were talking about his fingernails more than they were talking about his game. He right, comes out a- and talk. He comes out today, uh, Joe, and he talks about. I saw this kid at Arizona play, and I'm talking to the coaches saying that we're going to go out there and we're going to get this kid. Well, newsflash, that's tampering. So there's more things going on off the field with Caleb Williams. Have you heard anything from Bo Nix? Have you heard anything from no. Michael Penix? No. Uh, there, there is something to be said about when quarterbacks make outlandish statements like that. That nine times out of ten, it comes to bite them in the ass. Bottom line is, it. I don't know how much it will help Caleb in reference to – Joe, they're scoring 40 points a game last year, and the defense couldn't stop a bloody nose. I, I don't have a problem with putting him there. But you, in the middle tier for me, it's Cam Ward and DJU. So we're really? talking about – we're talking about DJU – Michael Penix, Cam Rising, and you got two newcomers. What if Dante Moore goes off at UCLA? My whole thing is, is that I think that he's going to lose two of those duels. I, I think he will. Caleb's going to lose two of those duels. Caleb's going to lose one, two of those duels, and everybody's going to be like, oh, man, what's happening here? That's just – I don't think they have the running game. I don't think they have the power in the running game like Utah does. Utah doesn't rebuild, Joe. They reload. They've all, they've continuously done that. And I will tell you as a better team, I've told you this before mm-hmm. on our show, the better team overall from top to bottom for me is Oregon. Yeah. Oregon is the more complete team front to back. Yes. Now that the defense under Dan Lanning at Oregon in year two – has kind of taken more of an SEC transform transformation here. What's Caleb going to do about, against that defensive, uh, that defense, and that defensive coordinator? So even though he won the Heisman, oh, everybody loves Caleb. Sounds good as a prospect. He's really good. What does he do in crunch time? That's what I need to know. Right. That's what's really disappointing to me about just the whole off season is that all we've done is talk about freaking Caleb Williams, which team th- th- we've gone as far as to say, should teams tank for Caleb Williams? Are we really going to sit here and do this uh, for a guy who's got one season of production? People were, but Joe, before you, before you continue on that, I'm yeah. old enough to remember in 2019 when everybody was saying was tanking for Tua. And then all of a sudden everybody was bobbling for Burrow. So right. just, be- just because just because everybody's out here saying tank for tank for Williams, look from top to bottom, things could go wrong for him. Their running game has to get better. If you take Jordan Addison out, can you get better? Let me again, Joe. People forget when you take away a weapon that was a Belinikoff Award winner and a first round pick. Joe, I've seen it. Like mm. covering LSU, covering the SEC. I I've seen. We saw Bryce Young. Joe, here's a, here's a prime example. What happened when Bryce Young's number one wide receiver, the first round pick, and Jameson Williams went down? He still played well, but it prevented them from winning. No, he did. Joe, he was below yes, fifty percent. Com- Joe, he was below fifty percent completion percentage. Okay, okay, at the end of the game, and then his statistically, again, from a completion percentage standpoint, took a dip. Third I, down I do, was worse. I see where you're coming from with that, and and not to to focus too much on Caleb. And I know that Caleb is, is so important for, for this PAC 12 landscape. I do want to talk about a point. I know we've got like about like 10 minutes left before we end up wrapping right. this. I want to talk about something that you pointed out that you said that you have DJU. If we talked about our, our top tier, our top tier is Caleb Williams, Bo Nix, Michael Penix. It's cam rising cam ward. And then I included cam ward. You did not, but you were g- willing to go as far as to say that once we move on to this middle tier, which there are a lot of names that come into that mix. Does Shadur Sanders is he at the top of that middle tier? Where does Hell DJ no. Uli, uh, wait, does DJ Uli Ungle like fit? Where does he fit into that middle tier? And then 
uh, Jane Delora from Arizona is another guy that has a little bit of talent, but I'm not super high on him. But look, I actually, I'm going to come out here and say this. I am more optimistic, and I know I'm making an assumption here that Dante Moore and Jane Rashada start in their freshman years. It might not happen, but they're the most talented quarterbacks currently on their rosters, so it's possible. But I'd much rather have their talent, green, fresh talent, than another season of watching DJ Uwe Ungalale underwhelm. I'm not bought in on the guy. I, I know that what Oregon State has had over the past couple of years has been inconsistent, hence why they went after DJ Uyunglele. But I don't know if that gets them into that upper echelon. I don't know if he deserves to be talked about in the middle pack. Like, he needs to go out there and ball out and have a really good start to the season for me to feel comfortable about him. Because the taste in my mouth right now, from everything that I've seen, has been horrendously terrible. Well, just so... I, I see some some people in the comments. Just so we're in reference, we've listed the list, people, by the way. <laughs> we did list them, but just so in case they missed it, we did list it. But maybe Bennett was coming in. Late, I, I don't know. Our top tier is Caleb Williams, Michael Penix, and you. And we talked about um, Bo Cam or uh, Bonick, excuse me. In the middle tier, which I put Cam Rising. That's what we were debating. And our top tier, you have the middle tier. Uh, Cam Rising, Shadur Sanders, and you said, again, help me here. Uh, I have DJ. I don't have DJU in that grouping. That's the only – those are the next two guys so, that I okay. have. Okay, so you have those, and then you have DJU in the bottom. So in, in reference to our list here, I don't think that you can make a comparison for the top three, even though I put Cam Rising in that top tier. The two yep. that you, you talked about, Joe, you have – and you've said this in the past – I feel like you have more um, faith in Shadur Sanders at Colorado than you have for DJU, and that I, – I, I don't yes. mean this – yes? Yes, I absolutely do have Joe, more faith he was in getting his, he was getting his teeth kicked in, in, in the FCS level. This is no, he wasn't? First, Joe, what did it, you not watch the championship game when he actually played somebody that was worth a damn? I will – I will – the – Okay, the Central first game that, that he played – the first team that, that he game. played in the top 20 in the FCS level, he got his teeth kicked in twice. My point Fair. is, okay, when you talk about no, oh, putting DJ below Shadur Sanders, not putting him in the middle tier, I will promise you this, he saw tougher defenses in the ACC than he's going to see in the Pac-12. Yeah, but he folded against every single tough defense that he played against. No, he didn't. He has had one good game in his career. One good game. That one Notre Dame game that he played, and we have so, and it's the same thing we've done with Spencer Rattler Nate, is that one good okay, game and we just Sanders talk about Sanders going against any type of talent like this before. No. He hasn't, but so look, again Shadur is difficult to project. I agree. It, it, difficult to project. Joe, they just over, completely overhauled a roster. We don't know what we have in Colorado much less have in the quarterback. I'm not saying that he's not going to be in that middle tier. I'm not even saying he can't get to the top tier. For you to come in the pre – not you, but you get what I'm saying. For yes. anybody to come into the preseason and say, oh, let's put him – you're name-dropping him, putting him in the middle tier. Because let me tell you what you do. Not you, but, again, just in general. People okay. talk Rudy Poo about Graham Mertz from the Big Ten who from went from Wisconsin to Florida. This kid has not only been more of an attractive quarterback in the Big Ten level, maybe even now in the SEC, than we do for Shador. Just because his daddy's name Dion doesn't mean nothing to me. Look, I'm not trying to oh. name drop placing him here. And I'm not saying that you're Shador name dropping is, because is... he bought a Maybach. We're going before the show. You're like, oh, he's got a Maybach. You no, no, no. The comment that you made is that you jokingly said, "Do we know if he's going to start?" Which we both know that he's going to start. And I said, "He bought a freaking Maybach. He's going to start." No, I know, I know. No matter what, he's going to start. Obviously, but look, I I understand that he didn't play that great against the more difficult FCS and HBC HBC opponents, HBCU opponents that he faced off against. I understand that, but what I at least going to do to him. I don't think he's gonna. I, I don't think he's gonna get his ass kicked. I just don't think that's that. Like that's a a, a a fair assumption to assume that he's gonna go out there and struggle. I have seen. Here's the difference for me. Oh, I have brother. seen DJU go out there and struggle so consistently, so frequently has he struggled. He has so few good and 
just highlight worthy games that I can point to. I think that Shadur has a lot of film on tape, a lot of plays on tape that shows that he has an NFL arm. I don't think that he's going to get drafted as high as some people believe. There's some crazy people out there that are saying this guy's a first round pick. He's not there yet. He's a couple years away if he ever gets there, but he's got a lot of talent. He's a great athlete. He's got a, a, a slightly above average arm. I think that on a team that is getting completely overhauled, him being a better athlete, him being a better runner, being able to expand the pocket, those kinds of things I'm willing to invest my time in. And to somebody, by the way, who's in the comments was saying that I'm putting the, them, uh, Cam Rising and Shadur in the same tier. I understand that I said that, but I am not comparing the two. Cam Rising is far ahead of Shadur Sanders. There is a pretty significant drop off after we get to Cam Rising. We kind of fall off a cliff with a lot of question marks. But what I'm trying to get at here is I am more confident in Shadur. I am more confident in the projectability of the two incoming freshmen than I am in DJ Uyunglele. <sighs> Joe, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you one guess. You said okay. he only had DJ. You only had one good game, correct? Yes. Would you constitute a quarterback beating a top 15 opponent and having four touchdowns a good game? Yes. Okay, well, he did that against Florida State. So, I, I, again, I do think he did have four. He threw for three, threw for one. He so, did, but that's like a I, – I don't know if I'm willing to – fine. I'm not going to sit here and debate. Let me stats. just tell you this. Florida State's defense is better than Colorado's. I'm going to tell you this right now. It's better than UCLA's. Uh, arguably, it's better than USC's. It might be better than Washington's. Again, when you're talking about what he's done in a conference that has better talent, that has better coaching, that has obviously more draft picks, we saw what he done. he's done. To say that DJ Yushin does not belong in that middle tier to me is just wrong. Now, I know we're kind of coming up on time here, so I'll just yeah. end us here with this. I – will continue to go down saying if you got guys like Dante Moore that step up, Jaden Rashada that step up, our lowest tier of guys that, yeah, they may not start, but they might come in here and get into this fold. Joe, this is the best pro – now I'll go prospect. Okay. From a prospect aspect, this is the deepest by far conference. They're not, they're not the best teams, though. I, I still believe that there's something to be said about the quarterbacks – like you have in other conferences, a.k.a. J.J. McCarthy, that have actually gone against better competition and done better. Yes, these guys are high prospects, but I don't think they're going to lead you to anything promising. That's just my opinion. But I could make the art. What's so crazy about this is if those quarterbacks play well, Joe, I could say that it could be the second best conference in the country because of how much firepower – those quarterbacks bring this conference. So it's a, either a really high ceiling or a really low floor with this conference. We'll see, man. We'll see. I know we're wrapping in about 30 seconds, but I will say that in the final year before USC and UCLA move on to the Big Ten, this conference, just this season alone, not in history, is going to be more competitive than any other conference not named the SEC. They're going to be more competitive than the Big Ten. They're going to be more competitive than the Big 12. They're going to be more competitive than the ACC. We just sat here and debated the quarterback play, but we're also talking a lot about these teams, man. These teams are all really freaking talented, and there are at least five teams that I think can win this conference if everything goes according to plan for some of them or if there are a couple of mistakes for others. There are five really, really explosive teams that are going to be ranked at the end of the season that could win the conference. My narcissism doesn't want you to get the last word, so but you better be glad time's up. That's all that. <laughs> uh, we should probably tell everybody where to follow us at Joe DeLeon at, at Blake Rafino at Rafino and Joe Show on Twitter. At Rafino and Joe Show on Twitter, man. We're coming for everybody. So thank you all for having us, and we'll be doing another one of these uh, Bleach Report streams soon. So y'all have a good weekend. night, guys. Peace.